Okay, thank you Leslie for the kind introduction and also thank you to uh, Mars and Binghai for the invitation to speak here today. And uh, I want to talk about basically a compound that has uh, shown up in this workshop already a few times, uh, zirconium silicon sulfur. Now this is a mouthful to say, so I will take a short version of that. I will call it for the remainder of the talk, I will just call it Zirsis, which is, uh, yeah, a butchered German way, way, way of uh, uh, contracting the, the, the elemental symbols here. So uh, Zirsis is a non-somorphic crystal with a number of Dirac cones and uh, also uh, shows in uh, this uh, kind of non-somorphic protection that we've been talking about before. But before I want to start, I want to pick up on a, a comment that Mars made and took it quite literally, actually, in the most literal sense of the word. Uh, can we dig up a topological insulator from the ground? And even in the most literal sense of the interpretation, uh, I can say we can, because um, one of our PhD students in the department, he actually found a topological insulator in an uh, old gold mine in the Czech Republic, which uh, naturally grows there. So uh, those surface states have been protected for millions of years. Um, and the mineral is actually called Kavazulite, and it is some you know, non-stoichiometric version of uh, probably bismutellurite with some antimony and some selenium atoms in there. And it looks like this. And now the key experiment is that we actually managed to do some photoemission spectroscopy on that. <laughs> and uh, it is not the worst spectrum that you can imagine. Uh, you see here, it looks very much like what has been found on the bismuth selenides and bismuth tellurides before. Uh, you see the valence band here, and you see the, the Dirac cone here, the topological surface state, and the uh, Fermi level here. So the band gap is also not small. It's about 300 uh, milli electron volts, and they have even managed to measure a whole mobility of about 1300 uh, centimeter squared per volt second. So this is what we can dig up from the ground. Uh, for everything else, we need Leslie to grow our crystals. So um, we've actually been quite happy for Leslie to, found her way to find her way to Stuttgart, and we've started a nice and fruitful collaboration with her uh, now. And uh, basically, the first project that we did together now was uh, her idea of Zirsis to measure this and uh, to, to look at the band structure and what is nice about this. Now, I don't have to exactly go into the details of this uh, crystal structure uh, because it's been mentioned before. It's a non somorphic crystal, which means that it features a glide plane, which you can actually put inside here, which is actually also the, the cleaving plane here between the sulfur atoms. Uh, the system, the, the crystal ni naturally and nicely cleaves. And uh, um, now, the interesting thing is, uh, where is how, how do you make this crystal somorphic, this crystal structure? And the way to do this is uh, to actually, to first of all get rid of this corrugation here, and then uh, make it a flat layer, and then replace the zirconium atoms by, or the sulfur atoms by zirconium atoms, or vice versa, to make them equal. And then uh, you actually get, along the z-axis, you get only one atom per unit cell and um, uh, per each per layer. And now this corrugation actually and the replacement of the, uh, of, or, or the, 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 the replacement of one zirconium atom by a sulfur atom again uh, is what doubles the periodicity or doubles the unit cell in the plane of the crystal. And this introduces this uh, non-somorphicity in the crystal. Okay, so the interesting thing is now in the band structure because non-somorphic symmetries usually introduce new kind of degeneracies in the crystal structure. And this has been uh, um, studied by Young and Kane also last year. Uh, the paper came out around uh, when we finished our uh, measurements and uh, so we were able to, to nicely put this into this context here um, with the doubling of the unit cell, which changes the band structure. Now there's the simplest case here where you just double the unit cell here by making it 
bigger in a, in a square lattice. And what you get is uh, then this band structure here with degenerate, uh, well, with a degeneracy along the MX line. And then uh, for the most of the remaining of the paper here, uh, Young and Kane discuss how to lift this degeneracy and turn the um, degenerate point here at the X point, which is the non-somorphically protected point, uh, into a nice Dirac cone. Yeah. So the special thing about this non-somorphic protected point here at the X point is that even spin-orbit coupling cannot uh, lift the degeneracy here in this point. So coming back, comparing this to Circes now, is um, uh, which of these realizations we have here. It's actually the simplest realization here. If you project the, the, the Circes lattice onto the surface, you actually get uh, this realization, the, the, the simplest realization, and we actually see uh, this band structure in, in the experiment. So zooming in now um, into the, uh, uh, the, the Bruyne zone here, we have the gamma point in the center, we have a, a square Bruyne zone with uh, the X point here at the face and the M point in the corner, and you see part of the band structure here. Now in Circes we have more orbitals that are relevant, so we double the number of orbitals here and we get something that looks like this. Now this is very reminiscent of what Andre has presented uh, in his talk. This part actually looks like an hourglass, what he presented here, so there's a close resemblance here, but actually it is not really because we work in the bulk. Our crystal has uh, spatial inversion symmetry, so our bands are actually spin degenerate uh, in contrast to what's been uh, discussed at the surface. Plus, um, uh, there is no real requirement for the bands to be degenerate here to meet at the gamma point. And this is actually also what we see. We, the upper part actually is degenerate and the lower part is actually not. So what we have is probably more like a leaking hourglass where uh, uh, the sand just uh, leaks out. Yeah? So it's not quite the same, it just looks like it. And I don't want to really go into the topology of the band structure here because this uh, discussion is still in a state of flux. And uh, so we are actually discussing this here at the workshop as we speak probably. And uh, if I had my talk now on Friday, we could probably come up with an answer, but it's still Wednesday, so we're not quite done yet <laughs> with the discussion. Um, okay, but now the interesting part is here. Um, uh, uh, around the X point. Now in Circes, actually it turns out that the frame level is pretty much exactly where uh, this degeneracy, uh, this crossing here occurs. And uh, uh, so it's very nice to measure for photo emission because we can actually observe this part to some extent and uh, the uh, non-somorphically protected point here at the X point is also nicely observable. Now the real band structure is quite a bit more involved. Um, uh, you see here again at the first part here is the, the gamma point, the X point and the M point. This is what we've been looking at before schematically. Now you can see here the green line is uh, one part that of, of this leaking hourglass. The blue part is uh, the second part and uh, this meets here the blue band with the red band at the X point and then collapses onto this degenerate band along the XM line. And you see here the green and the red band, they don't meet up at the gamma point here because there's no real requirement for them to be degenerate. However, uh, the blue band here, uh, the, 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 uh, the black band here disperses uh, towards actually the, green, the, the blue band here and they are actually de degenerate. So, um, so far for this benchmark, this is a DFT calculation which Leslie has done without spin-orbit spin coupling. Now, including spin-orbit coupling, uh, we have a lifting of most of the degenerate points here in the Brillouin zone, uh, especially this uh, Dirac point here. There's a small gap opening. However, here at the X point, there is no gap opening. Okay, we zoom in and this becomes a little bit more obvious. Uh, we have the somorphically protected band here and here, which is degenerate, and then um, uh, the crossing here from two bands which have different uh, irreducible representations, so they don't interact. 
Uh, one thing that Leslie has mentioned already is this very nice linear dispersion over uh, a really broad bandwidth of almost two electron volts here. And here it's, uh, it's even more. So uh, it's a very nicely linearly dispersing band structure. And I think only graphene comes close to uh, this linearly dispersing band. Um, again, this point here is the symmetry protected point. And if we now again turn on spinormal coupling, we find a small gap here of only 20 milli electron volts and no gap here. Now, spinorbit coupling is small, Z zirconium is the heaviest element there and uh, which is still very light, so uh, the gap is not very large and probably also not really observable in photo emission. Okay, one thing to mention is that these Dirac points or these gapped Dirac points actually form a line node which is schematically shown like this here. Uh, for part of the Brion zone, it actually then folds uh, onto the other parts of the Brion zone here. So we get a net of uh, Dirac cones uh, uh, or a line net of Dirac cones um, in the Brion zone here. Okay, now for the real data, um, we have the experimental band structure now, which was taken in Stuttgart uh, at room temperature in our lab uh, with 21 EV photon energy. And uh, this is seen along the gamma x line now, and we see a very nicely linearly dispersing band here, which is also shown as a guide of the eye by a dashed line here. We see the non-somorphically protected band <coughs> crossing at the x point here. And now there is something very peculiar, uh, which uh, we identified here as a surface state. It doesn't disperse with varying photon energy, uh, and it doesn't really fit in the, the bulk band structure. So um, it is most likely a surface state, or at least a state at the surface. Yeah? Because it doesn't really fulfill the requirements, what you expect from a, a standard conventional surface state behavior, because normally you would expect a surface state to simply disappear where uh, the bulk band structure is projected, yeah? where the projected bulk band structure is. It only exists in the projected band gap. Yeah? But it looks like here it actually just walks right through uh, the uh, bulk band structure here from the conical dispersion. Yeah? So um, this is quite was quite puzzling to us, but um, one thing to understand is that actually the bulk band structure is also extremely two-dimensional in this region around the X point. So uh, the projected band structure is actually not so, um, uh, not so broad or uh, doesn't take up that much space here. So this yeah, I don't know, maybe um, maybe reason, but um, I will show you now that we actually found a different interpretation for this surface state. Because the interesting thing is now, if you go uh, slightly away from the gamma x line, just parallel to the gamma x line, um, you find that uh, there's actually hybridization between uh, the alleged surface state and the bulk state. Now, if you look at this, you have the surface state here, and then the surface state here actually turns into the band dispersion of the bulk state, comes back here as surface state again, bulk, uh, and then uh, it merges again with the bulk state. And the same thing happens here. Uh, it's uh, more like a bulk state here and then surface state and uh, more like the bulk dispersion again. So this is, this is quite puzzling actually. There seems to be an interaction between these states. Now going perpendicular here, uh, this is now at the X point and along the gamma, uh, along the XM line, we see this surface state behavior here, which does not show up at all in the, uh, uh, in the bulk band structure calculation. And here we see the uh, collapsed degenerate uh, state dispersing from the X point down to the M point. Now parallel to this uh, line again, uh, now parallel to the XM line, going towards gamma, uh, we are actually now cutting around this crossing point here and we see that the bands actually seem to nicely cross and form another uh, Dirac cone kind of dispersion. And here you, down here you see uh, uh, the bulk band dispersion from the collapsed band again. So this is quite peculiar and uh, in order to resolve this issue, uh, okay there's more peculiarities here, uh, we, the, we looked at the, the Fermi surface also, and we see here part of the, the bulk Fermi surface here, 
And uh, this pocket is likely entirely due to a surface state, which doesn't show up in the bulk band dispersion at all. And um, yeah, one thing to exclude is that actually we have a surface reconstruction. Yeah, this is not the case. We've checked this with a lead. So there's no, uh, no additional uh, reconstruction at the surface. And if we zoom out now, we go to a synchrotron in Chicago at the advanced photon source. There is a brand new beam line now uh, going from 250 EV to 2500 EV. So you can get to higher photon energies and actually capture more of the Brillouin zone than we can at low energies. So the, the red part is what we, what we saw in the, uh, in, the, in the lab. And now we can actually, uh, this is now rotated by 45 degrees. The Brillouin zone is shown here. And uh, we see nicely the, uh, the square Fermi surface of the bulk. And then uh, not so easily resolved is the pocket at the X point. And the schematically, this looks like this. Now 45 degrees rotated again. We see the, the, the square, the diamond shaped uh, bulk Fermi surface. And there is no pocket at the X point from the bulk. OK, what happens now? Now, Leslie has done some slab calculations with uh, or DFT slab calculations of five layers. And uh, you see, actually, we superimposed or uh, yeah, we superimposed the, the experimental data here. And you see that it, there is an extremely nice correspondence yeah, with, the, uh, with the calculation. We see the black bands here show the, the what corresponds to the bulk bands. And uh, there's very little dispersion here, so, so the, the, uh, the states are uh, uh, not very far apart here in the, in the slab calculations, which indicates a quite two-dimensional behavior as opposed to uh, uh, this region here. And then um, we have the yellow part here, which actually corresponds to the, to the surface-related bands. And uh, we also see a very nice correspondence with, uh, the, um, with the experimental observation. Yeah? There seems to be this, this dispersion here and uh, a surface-related dispersion here. And if you go now, again, parallel to the gamma x line, we find uh, this, even this hybridization-like behavior. Yeah, the pocket here, which forms the Fermi surface, and then these sidebands here. If you go perpendicular to this at the x point, again, we find the surface pocket here again, and uh, also very nice correspondence with the uh, surface-related states and the bulk-related states here. So the, the DFT slab calculation actually captures what we see, but we still don't understand quite what's going on uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the electronic structure. So one way to resolve this is to go to a tight binding calculation. Now this is what Raquel has done. She's projected the DFT results onto a tight binding Hamiltonian. And now this image shows a projection of the band structure onto the topmost surface layer. Yeah, and the, the blue intensity uh, shows the bands that are strong at the surface. The dashed lines uh, show the, the bulk state yeah, here. And you find for most parts of the band structure, you find actually quite good agreement here yeah, and, and, and here and actually in this region, except now there are some parts which uh, strongly deviate here, here and, and also here. So now, um, zooming into this a little bit, it actually looks like that uh, there's no correspondence to this bulk state. Now, what we think is happening, actually, is that uh, at the surface, the, there's, a, there's a surface potential which selectively changes or select selectively breaks the symmetry of the, uh, or the non-somorphic symmetry in the band structure, yeah, due to the different orbitals that constitute these bands. Yeah? They react different, differently to the different symmetry breakings. So such that actually uh, the non-somorphic protect, non protected band here, up here, uh, actually breaks and uh, uh, these bands here separate. And this brings this uh, bulk band actually uh, down into the occupied states here and uh, actually bends the band uh, in, in, into this region, yeah? and the, the rest of the band is up here. Now, uh, the lower band actually does not feel this symmetry breaking and keeps uh, the bulk band dispersion 
as it's shown here. Another interesting point is that along the gamma x line, the, uh, uh, the bands retain their irreducible representations such that uh, there is still no interaction between the bands here and the crossing actually remains. So uh, schematically, we can think of it this way. We have the, the bulk band structure here. And now the uh, surface band bending is uh, shown here as the red line. And uh, the dash line is what it was before. And now, um, yeah, this is basically what we observe. And we have also this protected crossing, which is protected as long as spin orbit coupling is not turned on. There is a small gap opening with spin orbit coupling, but uh, we cannot resolve it in the experiment. Okay, now projecting this now back onto the onto the data, we actually find uh, the band dispersion here. Now, this this the data here is not very well visible, but it's it's right under the linear dispersion here, and we have this model here, which uh, uh, models the the surface related band. And then perpendicular to this, to the x point, we have the, the surface state here and the bulk state here. And now we can turn this into a, into a three-dimensional dispersion. Um, and we find, actually, that here we have a tilted Dirac cone at the, uh, at the surface. Now, the surface state uh, dispersion looks basically like this now. We have uh, um, two bands which interact, which cross here. Uh, forming this tilted Dirac cone, and this again kind of looks like a, a, a vial dispersion, but it's not because the bands are actually too uh, too fault degenerate from from the spin degeneracy. Still, which actually means that the surface state is uh, still trivial. It may be subject to a very small Rushbar type spin uh, orbit splitting uh, because of the still remaining small spin orbit coupling in the system, but we again cannot resolve this part. OK, this brings me to the conclusions. Um, CIRSIS is a nice model system for non-somorphic crystals. We observe this somorphically protected uh, Dirac crossing at the X point. We also observe these uh, Dirac line nodes. Uh, in the Burion zone, we have a highly linearly dispersing uh, energy window and uh, quite a peculiar surface state due to a selective symmetry breaking at the surface because these bands uh, actually have uh, different, uh, are made up by different orbitals which react differently to the surface potential. Now and finally, non-somorphicity is actually full of surprises and um, this means that with all the, uh, uh, well, predictive power that we have in theory and chemistry and so on, we should keep our mind open for, uh, for whatever happens in the experiment and Actually, the most interesting parts are the ones that uh, we didn't anticipate before. So the acknowledgments. Of course, uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge Leslie, and uh, 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 who grew the crystals and had the, uh, came up with the idea to study Tirsis. And uh, actually, the nice thing is that, that there are many more related compounds uh, that we can study now uh, with different properties. Judith and uh, Bettina, uh, or Judith, uh, also uh, grows crystals in, in, in both work in the department of, of Bettina Lodge. Then Carola did the first CIRSIS measurement. And uh, Jessica and Fanny are the beamline scientists in Chicago. Raquel did the uh, theory. And then Andreas uh, did also part of the uh, photo emission measurements. He's a successor of Carola. And uh, Andreas here, he, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, very useful discussions with him and then also Andreas for theory and uh, the other and, <laughs> and the other Andreas for the other theory. <laughs> okay, and then I want to uh, also acknowledge the, the Bessie team who helped us uh, very quickly. And thank you for your attention.